From Genesis to Revelation, the Bible is made up of 66 books that together tell one story, the story of redemption. It's the story of how God is making all things new. If you've been enjoying our This is the New Testament reading plan, you're going to love our newest resource, The Big Picture of the Bible. This set of 66 theme verse flashcards is designed to help kids and adults alike engage in God's word, memorize scripture, and ultimately better understand what the Bible is all about. Each card features one short selection from each book of the Bible that represents the theme of that book and how it fits into the larger story, your story. Friends, this is a tool you want in your life. So grab a card set and get ready to challenge your kids, your friends, your small group, yourself to learn the big picture of the Bible with you. So head over to the shop and get 15% off your card set with the code BIGPICTURE. That's 15% off with code B-I-G PICTURE at checkout. Hello and welcome to the She Reads Truth podcast, where we open our Bibles and talk about the beauty, goodness, and truth we find there. I'm your host, Amanda Bible Williams. And I'm your other host, Rachel Myers. Y'all, it is the beginning of a brand new study. If you were with us for the last seven weeks, we wrapped This is the Old Testament last week, and it was an incredible study. I hope you got to join us. If so, come along to the New Testament. If you didn't join us for the last seven weeks, welcome. You are right on time, and we're so excited to have you. This is a little bit different format of a study from what we typically do at She Reads Truth. So we are taking a key verse from every book of the Bible, and we're kind of spending a day per book on average looking at the themes that we're finding in these books, asking what's happening, asking how each book is important to be included in the rest of Scripture and how it relates with the rest of Scripture. The format of the study has been so fun and has really made for some really fun podcast episodes. We are joined today by Tara Lee Cobble. Now, you may remember that Tara Lee was with us for the first episode of This is the Old Testament, so it felt great to have her join us this week. If you haven't heard us talk with Tara Lee yet, you may not know that she is the creator and host of the Bible Recap podcast, and she's also the author of a book by the same name. Tara Lee also has a book out about the Trinity called He's Where the Joy Is. Y'all, she is such a joy to talk to, such a wealth of knowledge, and just a really fun conversationalist. Y'all are going to love this episode, and it is the first of five episodes in this series, so this will be a really foundational one to go forward in this session. We're so excited. Let's get right to it. Well, Tara Lee, welcome back to the She Reads Truth podcast. It feels funny to say welcome back because I wasn't actually here the last time (laughs) you were here. But still, welcome back. I'm so glad to be here, and I'm glad you did not play hooky this time. I was just at home playing video (laughs) games. I "I can't come in. Mm -hmm. I can't. I'm not available. (laughs) Um, So it's been seven weeks since you were with us to kick off This is the Old Testament, and we have covered a lot of ground since that seven weeks ago episode. Yep. We loved it so much that we really wanted you to come back and do the same with us for This is the New Testament. So we had our last guest um, at the end of the Old Testament was Nancy Guthrie, and she did such a fantastic job bridging, kind of hopping us from Old Testament minor prophets into what we're going to experience in the Gospels. But we're so excited to get to do this with you today. I'm so excited to be here. I'm going to tell everyone that Nancy Guthrie opened for me. Yeah, <laughs> that's exactly right. That's how you She's should word so it. Great. She's Add so, so great. Resume. Yes. She's so great. Rachel kept calling her Miles Finch, like from Elf, and <laughs> she was a good sport about that. But I not kept calling her. Like you yeah. didn't refer to. That sounds like you were actually referring. I was insufferable. Yeah. To, I am never <laughs> insufferable. <laughs> never. Um, well, we're thrilled to have you back. And this is what you do, right? Like you help. Yeah. You help people understand and frame scripture and kind of orient them and and you're like a tour guide for the bible oh wow and i like that. that yeah that's my and new so, that's my new twitter bio yeah. oh perfect <laughs> take it but it's true this yeah. is what Terry Lee does and while this is a unique series for our community we're kind of doing a thing that we don't typically do this is what you do It is. We're excited to have a tour guide for the Bible here with us to kick off the New Testament. And for our listeners, y'all have come so far. I mean, all of the work that we did and all the things that we found, all the Jesus we found in the Old Testament, Mm -hmm. we're about to get to see him in living color. 
yeah. in the Gospels, which is so fun. So let's start off. This week, we're going to study, we're going to look at Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and also the book of Acts. But let's start out specifically with the Gospels. Tara Lee, talk to us about why are there four Gospels? Like, what's the difference between those? Why do we need four of these? I love that that God gave us four different stories of his story, four different lenses. They each have these unique lenses that sort of fill in the gaps and fill out the story. And not only do they help verify each other, but they also just give us these unique insights. And so one of the things that I love about the Gospels is they give us a more complete and complex view of Jesus. And so like the four unique lenses, like Matthew's primary lens is Jesus as king. Mark's primary lens is Jesus as servant. And those kind of are they seem juxtaposed, but they're not. They it's do. showing this the fullness of Jesus. So it's not a contradiction, it's a completion. And then Luke's primary yeah, lens good. is Jesus as man, and John's primary lens is Jesus as God. So again, what seems to be a contradiction, but is really just this layering and filling out. And so we get this multidimensional view of who Jesus is, which is a multidimensional view of who God is. And I love that about the Gospels. Same, and I also have favorites. Like, I feel ah! like because they're all so different. Do you, okay, who's your favorite? Oh, I mean, can it be anything besides John? I don't know what your favorite is, but that's I fair. love John. I love John I, so I think much. That's that... also my favorite, mm-hmm. but I know that's not yours, right? No, I, I you love I, Luke. I I, no, I love Mark. Mark. He's just so economical. I love him. I think that he, he's so efficient. Rachel he's, really loves efficiency. I do value efficiency. That's great. And so that's my guy. Like, I, okay. I really love that. And we got to spend three weeks in Mark over Lent. <sighs> and so that was three weeks well spent. I loved it. Mm-hmm. But I mean, that's so good. It's hard. It's like picking a favorite child. I mean, of course, like we love them all. <laughs> and I can absolutely see why you love John. Tell us about why you love John. I think John reads like an action movie. I mean, it is yeah. just popping. It's just bam, bam, bam. I also love how much he, I mean, Jesus as God is yeah. such yeah. a vital message. And so he just really hammers that home. And even reiterates a lot of those themes in first, second, third John, which you guys will get mm-hmm. to later in your study. But I love John. I think he's really interesting. That's so interesting. Yeah. I feel like I love him for a very different reason. Like totally. I love how poetic John mm-hmm. is. You know, just the start of it. Like I will never tire of John one. Like mm-hmm. ever, ever, ever. It just feels like we get all the I am statements. It just feels so. Yeah. It just resonates with like I was going to say the poet in me. I'm not a poet. But I love poets. You love <laughs> and words, so, though. And, and I love words, and I love, like, word pictures, and I just feel like it's mm-hmm. so, he's so good at that. Well, and John feels so much more generous with his words, mm-hmm. whereas, like, we've talked about, like, Mark is so short. Yeah. Mm-hmm. John, he's not, I mean, Luke is the longest book in the New Testament, so, like, he's the most generous with his words. Right. But it just feels like there's something about the way that John delivers yeah. that's really beautiful. I love, it's my favorite resurrection account with John 20. Mm-hmm. Oh, I just love it so mm-hmm. much. So good. I think it's funny that even within John, the juxtaposition that we just discussed, I mean, you talk about him like he's like a Jane Austen or a Shakespeare, like this poetic. And Mm -hmm. I'm like, it's like Die Hard, you know? (laughs) I love it. But like where Jane Austen meets Die Hard, which is a a real narrow Venn diagram, but it happens to be the book of John. (laughs) Exactly. Yeah. Oh, man. So good. Okay. So one thing we want to be sure as we are beginning our reading of the New Testament, Now, when I say that, if you, dear listener, are jumping into this study now and you did not go through this is the Old Testament, first of all, welcome. You're right on time. I'm so, so glad you're here. Secondly, take comfort. We are not going to read all of the New (laughs) Testament in five weeks. We are going to kind of, you absolutely can. Mm -hmm. We're going to touch on each book and read like a thematic passage from each book. And what we're trying, what we're after here is to identify not just a key verse for each book, but like a key theme so that, you know, when we hear the name of a book of the Bible, we can kind of like, oh, I know how that fits in, or I know where that one is. So, you know, hearing the book of Mark, oh, that's a gospel. It Mm -hmm. talks about Jesus' life, ministry, death, resurrection. And so that's what we're after. And so we're going to do a flyover. And what I want to be sure that we touch on first is that The Gospels with a capital G, the genre of the Gospels in the Bible, although those do begin the New Testament and they are in the New Testament, the New Testament is not the start of the Gospel story because the Gospel story was present 
yeah. in the Old Testament. That's right. And we'll talk more about that. The New Testament is not the whole story of redemption. It's very, very important that we remember what comes before. That's exactly right. Yeah. And I'm sure our Bible tour guide would agree that, I the, know. <laughs> that our redemption story, if we limit our redemption story to simply the New Testament, I mean, Terry Lee, what are we missing? Oh, you miss so much. And Jesus said the whole Old Testament is about him. Like, that's what right. he said. All and right. so, and Romans, I think, tells us that the Old Testament is written so that we might have hope. That's and right. a lot of people, yes. when they hear about the Old Testament, they don't think hope. But that's mm-hmm. what it's there yeah. for, is to give mm. hope. It is a hope giver. So it is rich and lovely. Wow, I the love The Old that. Testament as a hope giver. Like, that's good stuff, and that's compelling, because you're exactly right that that's just not the way mm-hmm. that it's often portrayed, even in the church. Yeah. You know, right. we just sometimes we just really, really miss out. So we're determined not to miss out yeah. here at Series Truth. Like we want to we want to get to all of the books mm-hmm. and all of the words in every book. And it takes a lifetime. Yeah. But like Nancy said last week, what better book to invest a lifetime in reading than mm-hmm. the Bible? That's right. That's Your right. opener. Yeah. Your opener, Nancy said. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, that's Gosh. right. We start our reading day one of the series in the book of Matthew, in Matthew chapter three, with who I like to think is the last Old Testament prophet, hotly debated, but it's John the Baptist. And he is saying, repent because the kingdom of heaven has come near. But not only is he prophesying, he's in that fulfilling a prophecy from the Old Testament. It says in chapter three, verse three, for he is the one spoken of through the prophet Isaiah, who said, a voice of one crying out in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. Mm -hmm. So in that little section, before we get going really into Matthew, we get to see a prophecy about Jesus and a fulfillment of a prophecy about Jesus. And Mm -hmm. it's such a beautiful way to begin our study of the New Testament to go, the Old Testament mattered. And we go right from that into um, sort of the section for our key verse in chapter 4, And our key verse, here's the thing. So I wasn't here in the flesh to um, get to record the episode with you, but I did get to listen to it. And I've never heard such a beautiful voice read God's word before. (laughs) I would like to have a Tara Lee Cobble audio Bible. Yes, please. We decided we had a team meeting over here at Serious Truth, and we decided that's a thing we'd like to have. So All right. You just get right on that. However I can partner (laughs) with you guys, I'm thrilled to do it. (laughs) Well, I don't know where we want to read from today. I mean, I'm looking at Matthew chapter 4, our key verse is verse 17, but I would love to maybe back up to 12 and read through 17 just to get the context. Again, this is Old Testament prophecies being fulfilled in Jesus. Terry Lee, would you read that for us? Sure. This is talking about Jesus. It says, when he heard that John had been arrested, he withdrew into Galilee. He left Nazareth and went to live in Capernaum by the sea in the region of Zebulun and Naphtali. This was to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet Isaiah. Land of Zebulun and land of Naphtali, along the road by the sea, beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles. The people who live in darkness have seen a great light. And for those living in the land of the shadow of death, a light has dawned. From then on, Jesus began to preach, repent, because the kingdom of heaven has come near. For those of you who have just now heard Terry Lee Cobble read scripture for the first time, was I wrong or was I right? I mean, listen. It you was, were definitely right. I was not wrong. You were not what, wrong, <laughs> is what we're saying. Well, we're both so excited. One thing you said was that Matthew presents Jesus as king, right? Mm-hmm. And that's what we get in this key verse. He's ushering in the kingdom mm-hmm. of God. One other thing that sticks out to me about this passage, when you do a study, and you guys will see this as you move through the New Testament— Repent is the first message of Jesus. It was also the first message of John the Baptist. It's also the first message of the apostles. And like the first thing we ever do in our relationship with God is sin against him. Like we do that by nature, by our very existence as a part of fallen humanity. That's right. So the only next thing we can do besides sin is turn from sin to repent. You know, to repent means to turn and walk the other direction. And so... We're already sinning in our relationship with him. And so they're calling us to repentance. John the Baptist, Jesus, the apostles, they're all telling us, this is how you turn and walk in this relationship with the king of the universe. 
That's right. Yes. I love that. I remember many Advents ago, Amanda and I laughed and had this conversation about repent and believe and how one of those things is a lot more glamorous than the other. <laughs> and we were like, you just don't see repent on an ornament in like Swarovski <laughs> crystals. But wouldn't you totally put that on your tree? I would. <laughs> That's hilarious. Please, please start selling <laughs> that in your store. Can we make repent store? ornaments and not just believe ornaments? <laughs> oh my God. So to your point... <laughs> Terribly, yes, is what we're saying. The let's answer do. is yes, let's do. Um, I don't know about the crystals because I'd like it to be, you know, like manageable. Manageable. Yeah. Right? I don't want to like weigh the tree branch yeah, down. Sure. But to Tara Lee's point, the message that we're beginning to read in the Gospels, here we are in the first book of the New Testament, is echoing what we heard all through that's the right. Old Testament, like turn to the Lord, repent. I mean, that's what John the Baptist is saying, and he and he is. He is echoing those prophets. Maybe he's one of them. We will continue that conversation at a later time. But what I love about that, too, is you get this echoing, and then you also get all these fulfillments. We're going to start seeing Mm -hmm. Jesus fulfill all of these Old Testament prophecies about the Messiah, Mm -hmm. and he is the Messiah, and so it's just all coming true, so to speak, except in real space-time history. And one of the things we want to remember about the Gospels, so the word gospel means good news, right? Mm -hmm. We know that. And the thing about the phrase, the good news, is it's only good if it's also true. <laughs> mm-hmm. Like if this is just a fun story, there's not really any good news about, you know, wonderful stories are wonderful stories. And they may change something about the way I view the li- my life or, you know, they may change me in small ways. But this good news is like earth shattering, mm-hmm. you know, completely life altering, world altering good news. It even changes beyond it changing how we live, it changes that we live. I mean, mm. so, amen. Thank yeah. you. That's a I word. just think that repent is not a new idea. And I think that so often we look at the New Testament as, okay, here's the new thing. You know, it's called the New Testament. But even in our reading for the Matthew day, Ezekiel is saying, repent and turn from all your rebellious acts so they will not become a sinful stumbling block for you. Repent and live. And then Joel is saying, tear your hearts, not just your clothes and return to the Lord your God. This Jesus coming in and saying, repent is not a new concept. It's just coming now from the incarnate God. No big deal. I mean, the incarnate God walking the earth. I love the Ezekiel reading. We read from Ezekiel chapter 18, and there's a line there <laughs> where this is the declaration of the Lord God. This is in kind of the middle of verse 30. Repent and turn from all your rebellious acts, so they will not become a sinful stumbling block to you. Throw off all the transgressions you have committed and get yourselves a new heart and a new spirit. <laughs> And it said at the end of that passage, at the end of verse 32, it says, so repent and live. Get yourselves a new heart and a new spirit. And so what we learn from reading the Old Testament is that people can't do that to themselves, but God does that in us. And so and now we're reading the how, you know, like this is how, like Jesus is how we actually can have a new heart and a new spirit and we can repent and we can live like you said Rachel yeah like we can live like this matters for right now today and this matters for all of eternity mm-hmm. I'm trying to think of other you know before we go on to mark if our goal here is to kind of ask what's happening in this book and how does it tie with the rest of scripture a couple other unique things about the book of Matthew Matthew contains the Sermon on the Mount which contains the Beatitudes. And there are a lot of parables that are in Matthew that aren't anywhere else. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Is there anything else unique to Matthew, Terry Lee? I'm sure that there is. Oh, yes. (laughs) (laughs) I'm hard-pressed right now to think of what that might be. You know, with the synoptic Gospels, there is a lot of overlap. Matthew, Mark, and Luke, Mm -hmm. they're referred to as the synoptic Gospels, that they all sort of give their own lens on a lot of the same stories, whereas John has a lot of unique content that's exclusive only to John. So a lot of what happens in Matthew, you'll also see different lenses on that in Mark and Luke. Okay, going to Mark, just so that we can like stay on pace. Mark, as I've said, is my favorite gospel. It's the shortest. It's very economical, I said, or efficient. Mark, as 
many of our she's listening will remember from our Lent study, Mark uses the word immediately a lot. Like Mm -hmm. he's going to give you the temptation in the desert over the course of two verses. Like it's just very, very fast paced. But Mark also traveled a lot with Peter and Peter was one of the disciples. And so a lot of his information is coming from Peter who walked with Jesus. Is that correct? Yeah, I believe so. (laughs) Yeah. Listen, like, yeah, I think so. Yeah. (laughs) Matthew was an eyewitness, and so he's giving an eyewitness account. Mark, probably written by John Mark, yeah. was not relying but on Peter to be the eyewitness. He was hearing a, from Peter, yeah. Peter's eyewitness mm-hmm. account, mm-hmm. like That's a reporter. Right. That's right. And That's Luke right. kind of does the same thing, you know? Yeah. 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 I like that we get two firsthand accounts and two like reporter type style accounts. Exactly. And I think that Mark is written to the Roman audience first and foremost. And so then a lot of that is also we think maybe that's probably why it's a little more fast paced, a little more action packed, because it's like, hey, I'm going to try and like keep your attention. Or maybe that's just the kind of guy Mark was. It's hard to know for sure. And he probably had less detail if he was a right. not a firsthand account viewer. That's yeah. a good point. Less to say. Yeah. Whereas, yeah. you know, Luke, Luke has loads of detail, but he's a doctor and they have to be detail oriented. Right. So yes. he gives all that information like a doctor would. Yes. Yeah. So, yeah. That's a yeah. good point. So you had said earlier at the kind of at the top of the episode that Mark focuses on Jesus as servant. Mm-hmm. And that's actually in our key verse. I'm going to read our key verse, but then I want to talk about the context of it. So the key verse is probably something that you've, you know, most of us have heard. It's verse 45, but I'm going to back up to the middle of 43. Whoever wants to become great among you will be your servant. And whoever wants to be first among you will be slave to all. And here's our key verse. For even the son of man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. So that is our focus in the book of Mark. Maybe this is why one of the other reasons I like Mark so much, because I feel like the key verse for Mark, in my opinion, is also like Jesus' mission statement. Like it just feels like I'm the son of man. I have not come to be served, but to serve and to give my life as a ransom for many. So we love, you know, we've heard this verse. We love this verse. It's so true about Jesus. It just is like, you're right. I mean, it feels like it's so true about Jesus. Mm -hmm. It it is who he is. But the context of this verse Mm -hmm. just kills me. It depends on the day. (laughs) But sometimes (laughs) I just like I literally wrote in my margin eye roll. Yeah. Like, what are you guys doing? Yeah. Tilly, how do you feel about this story? Summarize the story for us. Same. Good times. Oh, my goodness. I wrote, ugh, that is me. Not yeah. about what Jesus said, but about the context, which is, you know, James and John, they literally say to Jesus, we want you to do whatever we ask you. Like, are you kidding me? What? Like maybe I, Jesus doesn't oh, know guys, what they're about to ask. You guys, like, my kids do that. And it's mm. crazy. It's like, hey, I need you. I want to ask you something. And I just, I want you to say yes. And I'm like, why would I? <laughs> Why would I but, agree to this? This is a trap. Unlike right? you, Jesus is all knowing. Like that he's is not true. you're not gonna be he's not gonna get like switch a rude. Like right. you're not gonna be able to yeah. be like, gotcha. Yeah. <laughs> I love that like this key verse that's so encouraging and telling about who Jesus is also is like a little it's a rebuke to like, hey, look, even I am here yeah. to serve. You guys that's right. don't. That's and I, right. And they're probably thinking, like, great, then serve us, do what we want, you know? And yeah. like that's not the big picture. But man, yeah. I mean, the juxtaposition of their attitude of servanthood versus the humility yeah. that Jesus shows and yeah. the humility that we're called to imitate in like Philippians 2, I think, Absolutely. you know, another passage that we cover in this section. Yes. Whew, so convicting. Yeah. So I feel you, Amanda. Oh, absolutely. And just like, it's so painful as a reader and so telling of our own hearts and humanity that like it's so painful to see so clearly how little they know and how mm-hmm. li- how narrow their perspective is mm-hmm. because even the things that they're asking and the way that they phrase it verse 36 what do you want me to do for you he asked them and they answered him allow us to sit at your right and left in glory and Jesus said to them you don't know what you're asking yeah you know, are you able to drink the cup I drink mm-hmm. or be baptized with the baptism I am baptized with? We are able, they told him. Like, they're just so naive right. and so so wrong. <laughs> and also mm-hmm. missing the point because right. right before, like right before our section that we have to read that day is Jesus foretelling his own death. 
Right. And so he's going like, you know, I'm going to die. The son of man mm-hmm. is going to die. And they're going like, cool. So if you're in heaven, could we sit next to you? Like they're fully missing why he came and what he came to do. Oh, I was just thinking like the entitlement that's happening here. I mean, so many ways that we take phrases that Jesus says when he says things like, ask anything in my name and I will do it. And we're like, all right, you know, I've got you in a corner. And then we hear these things like, if you believe it hard enough, you just have to believe and you claim it and you whatever. And like they believed that A, that he could do this. They believed he could do it because that's what they were asking him to do. I believe that too. And they believed that they deserved it. And like, they really believed this was theirs. Yeah. And it just goes to show, just because you want something, just because you know he can do it, just because you ask him for it and think you deserve it, it doesn't entitle you to a yes from God. (laughs) I feel like we need to like pause for emphasis. Like it... (laughs) It is true. Mm -hmm. And, and, you know, there's a tension that we have to hold as believers because scripture tells us to ask, Mm -hmm. you know, and scripture tells us to come to Mm -hmm. the Lord and to believe that he can, Mm -hmm. but it's so, you know, it becomes problematic Mm -hmm. when we view it as a formula of I'm asking and I know that you can Mm -hmm. and therefore you will. Matt, it's so hard. Matt Chandler to know. talked with us about this a little bit in our, I think, first week of the Kingdom of God study, and he talked about having an underrealized and an overrealized eschatology, or that we were living in, you know, where we were in the already and not yet of what power we have as citizens of the kingdom, and it was convicting and encouraging and challenging to kind of sit in that tension that we're talking Mm -hmm. about of, Mm -hmm. you know, going like, I believe it and I claim it, so I'm going to get it versus like, well, you know, if the Lord wills it. And like, where do we like, where is it appropriate to be on that scale? Because scripture encourages us and in fact, commands us to pray and ask Mm -hmm. for things and have not because we ask not. And also, I think you're exactly right, Tara Lee, that like, just because we think it's what we want or need or should have or... I mean, we've learned again and again on nearly every episode of this podcast by reading scripture that we have no idea what we want or need. When Jesus healed the crippled man, he forgave him of his sins first, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I love that tension of he tells us to ask, but we don't know what he should say. We know what we want and we know what he can do, but we don't know what he should do. Only he knows what he should do and will do. Exactly right. And I heard one pastor say, it's the difference between saying, I'm believing God for X, where you've Mm -hmm. like determined what the right answer is. And if God doesn't do it, then he's wrong and he's disappointed you and let you down. That's right. Or just, I'm believing God. Yeah. Like I'm believing God for X or I'm believing God. Like I'm believing God, regardless what he, I have no idea what the right answer is but I'm believing him. I'm asking him whatever he does is best. That's really good. That's very helpful. I like that. Hey friends, if you love She Reads Truth, you probably love how we pair God's word with the aesthetic beauty it deserves. We enjoy being creative and finding the beauty, goodness, and truth in the world around us. That's one reason we're so excited about our partnership with our friends over at Skillshare. Skillshare helps you move your creative journey forward without putting life on hold. Their short classes are a perfect fit for a busy routine. There are so many great classes on Skillshare on topics like photography, productivity, video script writing, and so much more. Friends, this online learning community is offering our listeners a free trial of Skillshare's premium membership. With Skillshare, practice makes progress. Advancing toward a creative goal is achievable with short lessons, hands-on projects, and classes designed for real life. Do something today you didn't think you could do yesterday. Explore your creativity at Skillshare.com slash She Reads Truth, where our listeners get a free trial of their premium membership. That's two weeks free at Skillshare.com slash She Reads Truth. Okay, friends, if you know me, you know that I love to cook. In fact, pre-pandemic, I had some of the girls from the office over to teach them how to prepare every course of a Thanksgiving dinner. It is fun to gather fresh ingredients and great people and enjoy a delicious meal together. But one thing I always tell the girls from the office is, if you're really serious about cooking amazing meals, the right tools make all the difference. 
That's where Made In comes in. They're a professional quality cookware and knife company, and they source the finest materials and they partner with renowned craftsmen to make premium kitchen tools available directly to you, no middleman. Plus, Made In products are made to last and they offer a lifetime guarantee. They have more than 28,000 five-star reviews and their products are used by some of the world's best chefs at Michelin star restaurants all over the world. I got to try the nonstick frying pan and I loved it. It heats everything really evenly, it's super easy to clean, and I can already tell it's going to last. Right now, Made In is offering listeners 15% off your first order with promo code TRUTH. This is the best discount available anywhere online for Made In products. So go to madeincookware.com slash truth and use promo code TRUTH for 15% off your first order. That's M-A-D-E-I-N cookware.com slash truth. Use promo code TRUTH. Made In, better cookware for better meals. So we've talked about that Mark presents Jesus as a servant, but specifically Mm -hmm. he presents Jesus as the suffering servant. Mm -hmm. And I think it's really interesting in light of this conversation that we just had, this passage that we read today or in this day's reading from Isaiah 52, verse 13 says, see, my servant will be successful. He will be raised and lifted up and greatly exalted. And just knowing what success means right there, That's right. <laughs> that because there's a colon there, and I know that punctuation is not divinely inspired, it's fine, but there are two different thoughts. See, my servant will be successful. He will be raised up and lifted up and greatly exalted. Part of Jesus' success is his obedience to death and suffering. That's right. And so it really, to have that kingdom perspective, and we'll link to that conversation with Matt, because I just think this is something that as believers, we will wrestle with our whole lives. Mm -hmm. But to remember that for Jesus, like Jesus' success looked very much unlike what the world thought or what, and even what they thought that a Messiah would look like. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And so, and that kind of explains our two little disciples here, our friends, James and John, (laughs) and it kind of explains part of their just confusion. Mm -hmm. It's interesting, Terry, we, of course, just came out of the Old Testament. And one of the things that we gained from those seven weeks there was, I think, a more accurate understanding of the character of the God of the Old Testament, Mm -hmm. which is just God, right? To be clear, God is not bound by one testament. But here we get incarnate God. And it becomes a Trinitarian conversation. But when we talk about Jesus as the suffering servant, how does that agree or disagree or weave in with the God that we've come to understand maybe a little more intimately in the Old Testament? Like, how is Jesus the servant the same as God of the Old Testament without ever changing and being any less God? Because we know Jesus is fully man and fully God. Yeah, I love how... Scripture never contradicts itself. It kind of fills itself out. And like we talked about with the Gospels, we have this image of like the God who is in charge, who loves us, who decides to enter into the chaos to create relationship with fallen humanity. And so it's just this continuation. It's not a contradiction. It's a continuation. And Jesus being the God who puts off heaven to come to earth and dwell in flesh. It's Mm -hmm. remarkable. It's It's so Mm awe-inspiring and gut-wrenching and beautiful and love-inducing. And I mean, you know, Isaiah 53, when Isaiah 52 and Isaiah 53 talk about the suffering servant, and it gives us this picture of this God who enters in, who takes on pain because of his great love. I love this answer so much. I knew that, like, here's the thing. When we ask hard questions about scripture, like, we always just learn, right? Like, it's not it's not going to fall apart. And I love that one of the first phrases you used was that we looked at the Old Testament God as the God who is in charge. And that never changes with Jesus. Mm-hmm. Nothing takes him by surprise. Nothing is taken from him. Scripture says, Jesus says, no one takes my life from me. I, right. I give it. I lay it down, right? So this God who is in charge continues to be yep. in charge in the New Testament. This God who pursues relationship, who draws in the marginalized, who loves the people of Israel and the people outside of Israel, Mm -hmm. just continues in the form of Jesus. 
It's not different. It's the same, but we get to see a different facet of it. I love that. I mean, so much of the time that I spend in being the tour guide of the Bible for people is trying to get them to understand that God does not get a personality transplant between the Old Testament and the New Testament. That's he right. yes. is the same. And Jesus, he is the way we see what the Father is like. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And That's exactly so this right. is he reveals the Father's heart to us. Yeah. And in a way that we can relate as humans, because yeah. he doesn't just, you know, come from the mountaintop or, you know, all these ways that we see God relating with humans in the Old Testament. But now he's going, no, like, let me just eat with you, you yeah. know, and let me yeah. like sit with you. And so now we get to see what it physically looks like, what God physically looks like when he is all loving, all knowing, all, mm-hmm. you know, like fully Friend just. of sinners. Yeah. Friend of sinners. Yeah. Fully merciful. All Mm -hmm. of those things. That's the perfect transition to the book of Luke, to the gospel of Luke. Because because Luke is, as you've already said, tour guide, it is presenting (laughs) Jesus as fully man, Mm -hmm. not contradicting his fully divine nature because he is Jesus and he is fully both. But one of the things we see that's unique to Luke is how we see just really an increased emphasis on how Jesus is going into the margins and including people and ministering to those in the margins and his concern for the marginalized and those who are overlooked. And that is so... Some of the classic objections to the God of the Old Testament, if we think of him as a separate entity, right, mm-hmm. which he is not, some of those classic objections, when you look at, you read a gospel like Luke and you see, oh, this is so intimate. Like this pursuit of the hearts of people, mm-hmm. it's very like Jesus is boots on the ground, like ministering with his own hands mm-hmm. <laughs> to sinners. And that is, I mean, that's our key verse for the son of man has come to seek and to save the lost, much to the chagrin of the religious leaders of the day. Like, what are you doing? Why yeah. are you associating with these people? But that's that we can read from some of these passages Oh yeah, and see some of that in action. I know that we should read from our key verse, but I would almost rather... Terry Lee, would you read from Luke 15, 1 through 7 for us? In Luke chapter 15, there are three parables, the parable of the lost sheep, the parable of the lost coin, and the parable of the lost son, the prodigal son. There are a lot of different names for that parable. But we're talking about Jesus as the friend of sinners, this pursuer of the lost. Let's read from chapter 15, verses 1 through 7. All the tax collectors and sinners were approaching to listen to him, and the Pharisees and scribes were complaining. This man welcomes sinners and eats with them. So he told them this parable. What man among you who has a hundred sheep and loses one of them does not leave the 99 in the open field and go after the lost one until he finds it? When he has found it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders and coming home, he calls his friends and neighbors together saying to them, rejoice with me because I found my lost sheep. I tell you, in the same way, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous people who don't need repentance. This is Mm. the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Sometimes we sing it. (laughs) And we, you know, just a couple weeks ago, talked about the book of Jonah. Yeah. And Jonah's, how shall we say, I mean, it's resentment. I was trying to think of a clever way to put it. Resentment for the fact that God Mm -hmm. dared to forgive and extend grace to, uh, pursue, extend grace to and forgive the Ninevites. And that so echoed in the way that the Pharisees respond. We also get Luke 19 in this reading day where Jesus pursues Zacchaeus. Yeah. And at one point when he goes to Zacchaeus's house, they say, he's gone to stay with a sinful man. <laughs> but it's just, it's almost comical, right? Because it's comical. It's so... And in different words, how often do we say that? Oh, yeah. Right? Yeah. I mean, like, I'm well, with you. Like... I'll tell you, whenever I read that verse where they're complaining and they say he's gone to stay with a sinful man, like it, it wrecked me because I'm so glad he came to stay with me. Right. Yeah. Like, yes. I'm just like, thank God. Yes, Zacchaeus is a sinner. So are the people saying that. And so am I. Right. And like, yeah. here is the God who came to stay with the sinful Terrily. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I don't know. That verse just like, ever since I read this a couple days ago, it has just been in my brain and has just, I'm just so grateful for it. 
Yeah. Mm -hmm. I agree. Y'all, I can't wait for you to read day three this week. This story of Zacchaeus. Also, I've read the story so many times and... I've skipped past that moment where it says, today salvation has come to this house, Jesus told him, because he too is a son of Abraham. It's he right- too is a son of Abraham. Right. Like that's, that's, that's what that's I'm incredible. I mean, that's what I'm saying. Like yeah. I feel like I've skipped over that part repeatedly. And then somehow I, I've just never drawn that connection between that passage and the lost sheep or like yeah. The, yeah. Zacchaeus was a lost sheep of Israel. And yeah. Jesus, he cares so much about the lost sheep of Israel. Israel and just the lost sheep in general. But this was, you know, he gave a parable, but then he, in the story of Zacchaeus, he showed the parable Mm. in like, in living it out. Yeah. He went and he sought the one out of the tree. (laughs) Yeah, and he celebrated yeah. that Ugh. this is what matters to me. Like he doesn't—he yeah. didn't just tell parables, but he showed us. And that's when we're talking about the God who is in control of the Old Testament and the New Testament. Jesus is the God of the Old Testament, who is here showing, like, no, no, no. Let me make it plain. Let me make it more plain. I want to dine with you, comma yeah. sinner. I want to dine with you. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Terry, my moment in this reading day. The parallel to that one for you was the Ezekiel passage. In Ezekiel 34, we get this picture where from the Lord's mouth, like the Lord is speaking and and comparing himself to a shepherd and his people as the flock. And he's just talking about all the things that he's going to do for them. I will rescue them. I will bring them and I will gather them. I will tend them. But listen to this. In verse 15, I will tend my flock and let them lie down. This is the declaration of the Lord God. I will seek the lost, bring back the strays, bandage the injured, and strengthen the weak. Like, that is such a tender picture, but powerful. You know, it's both of who God is. Mm -hmm. And that's what, you know, that's what he's does for each of us. And even like the rest of that, you know, it says, I will strengthen the weak. But I will destroy the fat and the strong. I will shepherd them with justice. Mm -hmm. Like that's our picture of God that is so tender, shepherding with justice. Mm -hmm. So when we talk about repent and believe and how, you know, I want to be the tender flock, but he's shepherding us with justice in a way that says, like, I'm not leaving you there. Like, yes, I celebrate that, like, I've found you and I've, like, located you. (laughs) Not that we're ever missing. (laughs) But I'm bringing you close to my heart, and my heart is a heart of justice. Mm -hmm. I think that's beautiful. Yeah. Oh, Luke, none of us picked you as our favorite, but goodness gracious. He's really so good. (laughs) Well, and I mean, like, I feel like we can't cover everything in any of these books, but the birth narrative of Jesus is just so beautiful in the book of Luke. I mean, when we're yeah. trying to distinguish, like if one of our goals is to distinguish these four Gospels, that is a for sure distinguishing factor. But yeah. man, friend of sinners, I think that actually that doesn't, they don't feel like those are separate conversations, like Jesus' birth narrative and that Jesus is a friend of sinners. I mean, that he goes low. He shows that even in his birth narrative. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. So that's Luke, friends. <laughs> And on to John. I mean, here's my guy. <laughs> y'all take it away with John. I mean, I, I mean, it's not like I'm like, well, he's not mine. But like, of course, I love John. Yeah. <laughs> to be clear, somebody read it. Somebody read this. Read, first read the part. whole book. Just, Here we go. Somebody read the book of John. Here Everybody we go. Everybody sit down. I feel like I should take a turn, but I really just want to hear Tara Lee read John one <laughs> real bad. <laughs> it's Selfishly. your favorite. I won't be offended if you take it. I'll read it if no, you want me to. Wa- but you but love the poetry because it's my favorite. I want to hear you read it. That's what I'm <laughs> saying right. here. Will you read? Read just really just one until you want to stop. <laughs> <laughs> All right. One through five. One through five. One through five. Here we go. Okay. In the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were created through him and apart from him, not one thing was created that has been created. In him was life and that life was the light of men. That light shines in the darkness, and yet the darkness did not overcome it. Praise God for five. The -hmm. darkness did not overcome it. Mm -hmm. I want to keep talking about the Trinity. Like, this is just so fascinating. Well, we've got our girl here who's been studying the Trinity, right? (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, Which is a pretty bold move, I've got to say, because the Trinity is so hard to talk about. Mm -hmm. Like, it's 
without getting caught in like without accidental heresy. Accidental heresy is a real thing. <laughs> Let me tell you, we had so many proofreaders on the Bible study that I wrote. Just oh theological. I was like, get everybody's eyes on this because I don't want to make mean, any. That's so good. You have to be so precise with your word choice. Yeah, you do. so precise. Tell yeah. me the title of that study because I remember loving the title, but I can't remember the title offhand. He's where the joy is. Come oh, on. that's yeah. great. Isn't that yeah. good? That's sort of our catchphrase on the Bible Recap podcast and in the book. Like okay. we end each day's reading with He's Where the Joy Is. Like finding God yes. on every page of scripture and delighting in Him and learning to mm. delight in every aspect of His character. Even the ones that we think are kind of not so, like, mm-hmm. you know, right. like, oh, we tolerate His wrath because He's so generous and loving and He is the friend of sinners. But no, even His wrath is praiseworthy. And it's, it's just mind boggling. Yeah. So yeah, it really is. Yeah. But when we look at John one and it says in the beginning was the word and the word capital W was with God and the word was God. Mm -hmm. I mean, I mean, immediately you want to go to Genesis one, one again in the beginning, but talk to us about the Trinity as we're learning about it. And is that the son revealing the nature of the father Mm -hmm. in the book of John? Yeah. I mean, John sort of helps fill out Genesis 1 in these beautiful ways. In Genesis 1, you know, God says, let us make man in our image. It's clear that it's a communal conversation. And so Mm -hmm. the idea of the Trinity in the Old Testament is like, you're in a dark room, all the furniture is in place, and all the furniture is there. The Trinitarian furniture is in the room, and the New Testament flips the light switch on, and you can see where the furniture is placed in the room. And so we see in Genesis 1 that the Trinity is there. The Spirit is hovering over the face of the waters. And so in John 1, we find out that Jesus is the one who did the manual labor of creation. God the Father spoke the creation command. God the Son did the manual labor of, of building everything. And then God the Spirit is hovering over it, approving and sustaining it all. And it's this beautiful work where God... The three in one, all three persons of the Trinity have the same personality, the same characteristics, the same will. They are identical to each other. They just have different roles and functions in fulfilling that will. John 1.10 says, and that's still part of our reading, it says, He was in the world, and the world was created through him, and yet the world did not recognize him. He Mm. came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. And then, you know, we talked in the Old Testament a lot about that theme of the presence of God, you know, that God was with Adam and Eve in the garden and then the the tabernacling and the templing and all of these things. So in verse 14 still of John 1, it says, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. We observed his glory, the glory of the one and only son from the father, full of grace and truth. That word glory brings us right back to last week's episode with Nancy talking about that the glory of the Lord is the presence filling the tabernacle, that they used the word glory to refer to that. But that's God now dwelling, now tabernacling among us. It's Emmanuel. Yeah, yeah. Oh, John. We love you, John. All right, I'm becoming a convert. Yeah. (laughs) Sorry, Mark. Well, and it's crazy. (laughs) When we talk about unique things about the different Gospels, 90% of the material in John is unique to John. Yeah. That's crazy. Yeah. Like, that's Mm -hmm. a lot. Yeah. I believe that because some people have researched this and told me. Because people told me to... But I really feel like I need to get out like a highlighter and start yeah. to work because that just feels like a lot. John also contains the I am statements. I love mm-hmm. the I am statements. Yes. We did a study as a community on the I am statements from John. I was initially thinking that it was the book of John, but that was a while ago. We, yeah, did, we haven't done John in a while. It has been a while. We're due. We are due. We say with a smile. But that study really resonated with the community, right? It really did. I remember did. it, like I think we sold out of books. and it, yeah. But yeah. because it's such a gift mm-hmm. to have Jesus saying with his own mouth, I am... The bread of life. The bread of life. Mm-hmm. I the door am of the sheep. The door of the sheep. The resurrection the and life. The Resu- true vine. I mean, let's go. All the things. <laughs> it's so good. Because it's so clarifying and important and rich. And before Abraham was... I am. Oh, that's Man, I love that John reminds us Jesus was not created. He did the creating. He didn't just come into existence when he was born in Bethlehem. He has mm-hmm. always been. He is God. If he weren't God, he would not be able to bridge the gap between us and yeah. God. Like, yeah. you can only be a translator if you speak both languages, you know? And 
So like for him to be able to bridge the gap between God and man, he has to be fully God and fully man. Not 50-50. He's not a hybrid. Right. He's not a unicorn right. nope. or a cyclops. He's, you know, like fully God, fully man. Both. Fully not, both. Not unicorn or cyclops. That's not what I meant. Unicorn or um, the- what's the... Centaur. He's not a centaur. centaur. He's not yes. a mermaid. He's fully God <laughs> and fully man. There yes. it is. Oh. So good. Okay, girls, here we are. I Acts. feel I feel so excited and prepared now to talk about the book of Acts because we've talked about the Trinity and there's so much Trinitarian activity mm-hmm. in the book of Acts. Mm-hmm. I don't know that Trinitarian it's, activity. Trinitarian activity is the hashtag of the day. I don't <laughs> know that it's easy or responsible to talk about Acts in five minutes, but we're going to try because <laughs> it's so important because it is so also written by Luke and kind of like a sequel to Luke. Like it just yeah. picks up where, where the gospel of Luke. Yeah. yeah. Luke part two. That's right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And we're going to see what next. We're going to see what happens between like his resurrection and then we have his ascension, right? And then we have the church, yeah, the building of the church. Mm-hmm. And that is, that is the book of Acts is the beginning of that story. And the pressure's off. As a community, I love to just give little happy spoiler alerts. As a community, we're going to be reading the book of Acts this October. So like we're yes. going to get the full thing That's in a not few even months. far from now. It's not That's even so far from now. Okay. Let's read. I really want to read chapter one, verses four through 11. I know we don't have a ton of time, but I really want that moment because I think we only think of Jesus as being in the four gospels and we forget this account of Jesus Mm -hmm. promising the Holy Spirit and his ascension in the book of Acts. Terry Lee, will you read that for us? Sure. While he was with them, he commanded them not to leave Jerusalem, but to wait for the father's promise, which he said, you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit in a few days. So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, are you restoring the kingdom to Israel at this time? He said to them, it is not for you to know times or periods that the father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come on you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. After he had said this, he was taken up as they were watching, and a cloud took him out of their sight. While he was going, they were gazing into heaven, and suddenly two men in white clothes stood by them. They said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking up into heaven? This same Jesus who has been taken from you into heaven will come in the same way that you have seen him going into heaven. So much information in such a short little passage. Right? Amen. Okay. And then, I mean, jumping straight from that to Pentecost in Acts chapter two, um, I, it's... Sorry for whispering in a weird way. Yes. I'm so excited. I love Pentecost. I mean, I love how beautifully Nancy kind of set some foundation work for us Mm -hmm. about Pentecost last week, talking about the fire coming down, the spirit coming down in fire. And in Pentecost... It doesn't come down on a building anymore. It comes down on people, Mm -hmm. these living stones, as Peter refers to us. And that key verse, Terry Lee, that you read from verse 8, which says, you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. That's happening at Pentecost. So the Spirit's coming down and everyone gets a different language. And folks are saying, look, aren't all those who are speaking Galileans? How is it that each of us can hear them in our own native language? We hear them declaring the magnificent acts of God in our own tongues. So thus begins, really Acts is a very important book for a great deal of reasons, but it's going to set up the beginning of the early church and it's going to Mm -hmm. spread us out from Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Acts also gives us in chapter nine, Paul's conversion and then the... No big deal. (laughs) Well, it's just the guy that's going to write most the of next the thirteen New books that we're going to study, <laughs> and then it also gives framework for those next thirteen yeah. books that we're going to study. It kind of talks about those. Okay, Terry Lee, I want to have an intelligent question for you, but I just want you to talk to us about <laughs> the book of Acts. <laughs> oh man, I I love. Uh, the way God works in this progressive revelation throughout scripture, the way he progressively yeah. reveals more of himself. Again, not a contradiction, a continuation. And so the Holy Spirit all along, God's been promising it. Remember earlier in this conversation, we were talking about, you got to get a new heart. You got to get a new spirit. I'm the one who gives that to you. And then we see him doing it here. But like, it's crazy how much, as many times as Jesus said stuff, 
they never actually figured out what was really going to happen. And so he kept saying, like, I'm going to die and rise again, get a die and rise again. And they're like, he died. Oh, no. And, like, they just completely don't understand. What's going to happen next? Right. Even after he's resurrected, they're like, now it's time to conquer Rome, right? And he's like, no, still not the plan. That was never the plan. (laughs) Don't you remember? My kingdom's not of this world. And so when I think of the way that they consistently misunderstood the things that he was saying— and he kept promising the spirit, I wonder what they imagined that was going to be like. I wonder what they thought it meant. Because when we see what actually happens, like if I'm putting myself in Peter's shoes and, you know, the shoes of these apostles who walked with Jesus and have been hearing what he's been saying all along, I'm never going to think, oh, the spirit, it's going to be like an indoor tornado and fire holograms and language convention. Like that's not what I'm expecting. (laughs) And so when this happens and we see the way that God is working in this, The message that he's sending, up until that point, the message has been almost exclusively delivered to Jews, to Hebrew-speaking Jews. And so when all of a sudden these Galileans are speaking in their native language, but other people are hearing it in their own language, it becomes evident that the Holy Spirit is intent on sending the gospel out to Judea and Samaria and all the world, and that this message is not just for the Jews. That's what this instance is about here, is letting people know, the gospel's for everyone. Yes. It's got to yes. go outside these walls to the whole world. The gospel's for everyone. And you can't contain it. Even when you're speaking in your own language, they're going to hear you in their language because that's how powerful I am to get my word out to the people I love. Yes. I love it. Ah, Amen. Yes. <laughs> I like to end it with, I love it. I, but you're right. God, Jesus, Holy Spirit, same intent. Mm-hmm. If this is yeah. the goal. They're all then, working then in tandem toward the same goal. The spirit's intent will be the very same. Oh, yes, I love it. My goodness, I'm so excited about next week because really it's just getting started. I mean, yeah. the climax of Jesus coming and being mm-hmm. fully man, fully God, and then giving his life, conquering death, ascending to the Father, sitting down, yeah. <laughs> and then sending the Holy Spirit like, okay, now the work begins, Yeah, right? And what you just said, Tara Lee, that the gospel is for everyone— The New Testament, as we continue to travel through the New Testament, it is just going to keep doubling down on that message. That's right. And we're going to keep hearing more and more about how and like the theology of that and what that means and and like commands for how we participate in that. And so I am stoked. You guys have to come back. Mm -hmm. I wish our Bible tour guide was going to be with us (laughs) next week, too. We have a great guest for next week. We're going to be in good shape. Hey, before we wrap... Tara Lee, we didn't get to do this when you were here last time, but at the Shiri's Truth Podcast, we open our Bibles for an hour and talk about the beauty, goodness, and truth that we found there, which we did this hour, and it was amazing, and also it felt really fast. Mm -hmm. Um, But at the end of the hour, we ask our guest, where in your life are you seeing beauty, goodness, and truth that's pointing you to Jesus? Mm, Just some beauty that I'm seeing right now in my life is the sweetness of the Lord's timing. When I spoke with you guys before, I was trying to get into Israel for a trip that's not allowed under COVID restrictions right now, and I had to get a special permit for it. And I was knocking on every door. I spent probably 100 hours trying to get in. And somehow, overlapping with my efforts, the Bible Recap podcast caught the attention of some people with the Ministry of Tourism in Israel, and they contacted me about being a guest on my podcast. And I was like, uh, guys, can we can we have a phone wow. call maybe? I have some, I have a that? favor to ask you. And like, that was not a door I had knocked on, but they sought me out and they got me into Israel. And so I'm me? so grateful that, that so the Lord- That is so specific. Right? It's just like yes. the Lord's timing. I just am so, so grateful for it all. So generous wow. of him. That's yeah. so exciting. Well, we're excited about your study. He's where the joy is. Me too. Um, and continue to just be big cheerleaders of the work you do and the Bible recap and the book, the podcast, all the things. Keep doing what you're doing because you're yeah. such a blessing to us. Ah, uh, same. Likewise. <laughs> I mean, listen, come back anytime. And y'all listening Go read your Bibles this week. We've gotten you all set up and you are ready to spend some time in the four Gospels and Acts in the coming days. And then do come back next week. It seems to be triple name week I or love celebration. It so, much. so we've got Terry Lee Cobble. Next week we have Kim Cash Tate. And then the week after that we have Jennifer Lucy Tyler. So listen, and every time you're going to have good old Amanda, Amanda Bible Williams. Williams. That's right. <laughs> 
So you just call me Rachel Bible Myers and uh-huh. everything's fine. <laughs> mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. so I can be in the club. Hey, y'all come back next week. We're so excited. I know we need to wrap. Thank you for hanging in with us. This was worth the extra length of the episode. So fun. Terry Lee, again, thank you for joining us. Thanks and for having me. And until next time, what do we tell our friends? Keep opening your Bible. Keep opening your Bible.